Hello everyone, my name is Pixel Riffs, and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. Today, we're going to go to the Nether, but before we do that, we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Our chests are still Christmas presents because it is the 26th of December, but that should go away by tomorrow. So I'm going to start tidying up some of the stuff from our copper smelting furnace here. It hasn't smelted all the copper. All of the raw copper that is left in the chest is still filtering on through, but we got most of it taken care of, and there's still a little bit here in the furnaces that we can remove as well. I turned all of the copper that was in this chest into copper blocks, which are now safely stored in the basement, and I don't even have room for a couple of these in my inventory. So we're going to condense all of these back down into raw copper blocks, which we might end up building with later, because they're quite pretty, but for now we need to just put them out of harm's way. We can always smelt those down later if we need some more of them, but I figure we might as well just leave them there. And we might still get a little bit of experience from the blast furnaces as we destroy them, which hopefully will lead us, there we go, to at least level 30 because I want to enchant one more item before we go to the nether. I'm thinking we probably want to enchant another pickaxe. I did leave one around here, but I think I left it down here in the enchanting setup. Yes, there we go. Let's see if we get anything useful on a level 3 enchantment on a pickaxe. We got unbreaking 3 and efficiency 4. Very nice, actually. I could do with both of those things on a new pickaxe, and we'll check on the book enchants just in case we got something good. Protection 4 on a book seems quite good. Okay, we'll return to that a little bit later. This auto smelting setup will probably return in future, but I just want to move it out of the way for now until we find a more permanent home for it. And speaking of more permanent homes, I've decided that the fisherman's shack is actually where I'm going to be storing all of the stuff that I get from fishing. As you can see, I've been doing a little bit more fishing. The fishing rod is serving me pretty well. We've got a few more fish in here, and I've caught a little bit of loot already. The best thing I got so far is currently awaiting me in that barrel over there. But for now, I want to show you a bit of the interior of the fishing shack. I decided to divide this up into a bedroom here on the left with a ladder that goes up to the top floor. On the right hand side here we have a little bit of storage with a bunch of barrels in which I'm keeping all of the different types of fish now. We've got two on that side for the more common fish, a puffer fish in there, a clownfish in there, a tropical fish, whatever you want to call it. And then up in here I've been keeping some of the other junk and loot. The saddles and the leather goods are all in here along with the rotten flesh. I might end up keeping name tags in here if I get a lot of them. And in this barrel by the front door I'm keeping some of the fishing rods that I've been using so that I know where they all are if I just want to grab one and do some fishing here in the river. Towards the back of the house we have a little bit more storage here and under the stairs and the stairs lead up to the next floor which doesn't have a huge amount of headroom in it right now but if you remember we put a lot of supporting copper blocks in here which we can actually start to remove now and open out the space if we want a little bit bigger of a roof and I kind of favor that actually because right now if I end up coming up the ladder from the bedroom, I bang my head on the roof up here. So I'm going to remove all of these blocks, including the one that's supporting this lantern, and we'll just stick the lantern back underneath that oak log there, and hopefully we shouldn't create too many holes in the roof by just clearing out a few of these extra copper blocks. There we go, it's looking a lot more spacious up here. I feel like we could do something with this space if we wanted to. We could even continue boarding it all with oak slabs like I have done so far. But for now, at least we've retrieved a bunch more copper blocks, and the roof has not aged in the slightest since the last episode, even though the vines have all grown down to kind of ridiculous levels. So we could shear those a little bit later. The Wandering Trader is here, but I'm going to ignore him for now because I still don't have any emeralds yet. And we're going to focus on today's episode and going to the nether. Oh, one last change I wanted to make to the fishing shack on camera actually was to show you folks pressure plates. I have a couple made up in my inventory already. They just require two wood planks of whatever matching material you want will create a pressure plate of the corresponding material. An oak pressure plate, a spruce pressure plate, whichever ones you want really. Pressure plates are redstone components which if you step on them will activate anything that is redstone activated nearby. In this case we can use them to open doors and we're going to put these in inside of the fisherman's home here so that the doors automatically open and close when we walk through them. So here, for example, I can open the door just by standing on the pressure plate and it closes automatically when I step off the pressure plate after I've left. We need to open the door manually from the outside, but once we step on through, it will close automatically behind us. And typically you want to put pressure plates on the inside of your doors, but not the outside because these can also be activated by mobs. Oh, and 
and I promised to show you what I got from fishing just now. This enchanted book has four enchantments on it. It's got Unbreaking 3, Efficiency 4, Piercing 4, and Sharpness 3. That would actually be perfect to enchant a pickaxe or an axe with. In fact, the axe could also get sharpness on it, so we might actually save this until we get a few more diamonds and we want to upgrade a diamond tool a little bit later. But for now, we've got an Unbreaking and Efficiency pickaxe. We've got our Unbreaking Fortune 3 pickaxe. That should be everything we need. So it's time to talk about going to the nether, finally. Down here in my basement, I'm going to pick up a few ingots of gold. I think I'll probably grab, let's say, 25 of these for now. We're going to make ourselves a gold helmet. And if it is your first time going to the nether, I highly recommend crafting some gold armor before you do. In fact, I also recommend leaving behind any equipment that you're worried you might end up losing, because the nether is a pretty dangerous place and has lots of opportunities to lose your equipment irretrievably, so I highly recommend leaving behind anything that you feel like you might end up missing. In my case though, because I'm relatively confident that we're going to do okay once we go to the nether, I'm still taking a bunch of my diamond stuff with me, but you might want to dig up any old iron gear that you have in the attic or anything like that before you go to the nether if you think there's a good chance that you might run into issues. We're going to take our boat from over here in the fishing shack and we're actually going to row out across the ocean over here back to the jungle biome where we encountered that nether portal by a lava lake. Because these ruined nether portals are really the game's only indication that nether portals are an aspect of the game at all. Before they were introduced to the game, Minecraft really didn't offer you any hints about the fact that the nether existed. It was really just handed down knowledge from player to player and the kind of thing that you would find out by watching other people play Minecraft or going to the Minecraft wiki. But these frames made out of obsidian are our portal to another dimension, the nether, full of the kind of stuff that you see around here, these mysterious red blocks which are called netherrack. These blocks are actually what makes up the landscape of the nether along with a decent amount of magma and lava, but there are other things to consider when going to the nether and that's why I'm going to briefly explain what we might see if we step through one of these portals for the first time. Much like the overworld, the landscape of the nether is split up into biomes and the first time you step through a nether portal, there is no real guarantee about which of the biomes you will end up in. You might even end up in one of the nether's many generated structures, although the likelihood of that happening is relatively slim. The nether's most basic biome is the nether wastes. This is the one that's mostly made out of netherrack and not much else. You'll see a few ores dotted around the place and you will see a lot of zombified piglins and regular piglins wandering around minding their own business for the most part. There are crags in the landscape and ravines, but by and large they are typically fairly uncomplicated biomes to explore. The nether is also home to two different types of forests, both fairly distinct in their colour, one of which is the Crimson Forest, which is really where the piglins make their home. These are sprawling forests of red foliage where you'll often find hoglins, these giant pig beasts wandering around, and those are a little bit dangerous, so you might want to make sure you bring a shield with you and have your wits about you when the hoglins are roaming the landscape. The Crimson Forest's counterpart is the Warped Forest, which is a landscape full of cyan foliage where pretty much nothing spawns with the exception of Endermen. And these are probably the best case scenario when warping into the Nether because Endermen are neutral to the player unless you look directly at them, so you're less likely to encounter hostile creatures in this biome and that should give you a good chance to get your bearings. For me, the other two biomes are tied for the worst case scenario, basically, but we can make the most out of whatever biomes we get. The Soul Sand Valley is a vast rolling brown landscape with Soul Sand, which is a block that will slow you down if you walk on it, and Soul Soil, which looks kind of similar but doesn't come with the same slowing down mechanic. These biomes will typically have a lot of skeletons roaming around and a higher amount of ghasts floating in the sky. Ghasts are pretty dangerous. Dangerous. They can shoot fireballs at you from a distance and are difficult to take down if you don't have a bow. So often soul sand valleys can be a little bit tricky to get established in if you're a player going through to the nether for the first time. But to my mind, the worst case scenario is probably the basalt delta. These landscapes are pitted with lava, they have 
giant columns of basalt everywhere, and they are populated almost exclusively by magma cubes, which can be a little bit tricky to deal with. They're basically the nether's equivalent of slimes. The basalt everywhere is a lot tougher to mine through than netherrack. There's also a lot of blackstone around, which can be quite nice to gather if you want to start building with it, but in the meantime, you're going to find yourself assaulted by magma cubes and in danger of falling into lava at every turn. So let's hope we don't get either of those last two. I've cleaned up the nether portal a little bit, and the job we have now is to reconstruct this thing so the frame is complete. And that's going to mean extracting the crying obsidian blocks from the frame, since technically they're supposed to be like broken obsidian. There we go, we get the who is cutting onions advancement for that. We're going to be keeping hold of the crying obsidian because it has its uses. It's more than just a decorative block. So we're going to leave that in the chest over here by the portal and we might come back to that a little bit later. Now we're going to move this column of obsidian over so it connects up to the rest of the frame, more or less. The idea behind nether portals is that they need to have a two block wide and three block high hole in the center of them ringed with obsidian. So the whole obsidian frame comes out to four blocks wide and five blocks tall. Now that those are gathered up, we're going to replace them in the spaces of the frame all the way up to there. And this gold block we're probably actually going to take with us since it's quite nice to have a little bit of extra gold where we're going. But after that, we do need to find an obsidian block to go here. Now, technically speaking, the portal doesn't need to have these corner blocks at all, since the portal interior needs to be two by three, and as long as it is completely ringed with obsidian, we should still be able to light it. So I'm going to put this block up here, and even without that corner, we can actually light the portal. But you know what, I think that still looks a little bit strange. So what we're going to do is come over here, grab a little bit more lava, we're going to put our water bucket down in there, and even if we end up breaking this block, the water is going to flow out into the lava around it, it should form the lava sources into obsidian, and we should be safe from the lava coming in on us and preserve that obsidian block we were mining. There we go. So we're going to fill that in the corner there as well, taking care not to step on too many of the magma blocks around the outside. And these stone bricks and mossy stone bricks here are really just for show, so we can take all of those out of the way if we want to. Although, you know what, since it's here in the jungle, I might as well leave those there. Inside the chests next to any of these broken nether portals, you will usually find a few other bits and pieces, including something that I didn't realize earlier, an unbroken breaking two helmets, so I might actually trade our golden helmet out for that, and we're going to put the gold helmet on, for reasons I will explain once we get into the nether, but ideally the first time you step through a nether portal, you want to make sure you're wearing at least one piece of gold armor. The chests will also contain, usually, some iron and some flint, or an entire flint and steel, and the flint and steel is going to allow us to enter the nether by lighting this portal. So I'm going to make a quick crafting table here, so that we can craft the iron nuggets here into a full iron ingot. And then in any crafting interface, we can just click on the flint and steel recipe, put them in here in basically any order, and you'll get a flint and steel out of that. Now, right-clicking inside the portal, which would normally create a flame, because flint and steel is used to light fires everywhere, it turns the portal into this glowing, purple, welcoming, exciting, dreaded portal. And having retrieved our crafting table, let's step on through to the nether and we'll see where we end up. Okay, oh, okay, this is great, actually. Uh, this is a Crimson Forest. So as we saw from the introductory video there, Crimson Forest, not the worst, <laughs> not the worst option, actually. Not the worst place we could have been, so... I think we should be okay here. There's already lava falling from the ceiling, though, so we need to keep an eye on any lava that might drip down from the walls around here. And there's also... Yeah, there's a giant drop into lava right there in front of our portal. So, in theory, it would be a good idea to make sure we block off the area around the portal to make sure that we are safe from anything like that. But for now, I think I want to do a little bit more exploring. And immediately we run into a group of piglins. These guys are going to be neutral to us because I made sure to wear a piece of golden armor into the nether. As you can see, these piglins do like their gold. They will be wearing pieces of gold armor and they will inspect any gold items you throw on the ground and then keep them for themselves. If you're wearing gold armor, they will stay neutral to you, but 
I think I'm going to put myself in harm's way here just so I can demonstrate that if you take the gold armor off, they immediately decide to attack you like that. And then <laughs> if you're quick enough, you can put some gold armor on and then they'll just end up firing that crossbow ineffectively. And the rest of the time, they'll stay pretty neutral to you. That changes when you have gold ingots with you because you can actually trade with these piglins by bartering gold ingots for other items. And if you right click on a piglin or you throw a gold ingot on the ground, they'll all run in towards it and the one that picks it up will offer you something in exchange. And in this case, he's offered me some of the best stuff we can get. That is a splash potion of fire resistance, which will help us against the fire or lava that we're going to find in the nether and <laughs> some spectral arrows. Now, the reason these guys have just started to run around and make scared noises is because this guy showed up. This is a zombified piglin and he is effectively the equivalent of a zombie to the player in the overworld. Zombified piglins are neutral to the player until you attack them, much like the piglins will be. Except if you attack a zombified piglin, they kind of gang up on you the same way wolves do in the overworld. And attacking a zombie piglin is pretty much a recipe for disaster in the nether since there are a lot of zombie piglins in some of these biomes and getting a whole bunch of them hunting you down with gold swords is not my idea of a good time. Now, as we look around here, we'll start to see a few other exciting things. Looks like there's some glowstone right here, which I am very keen on acquiring, actually. Glowstone can be broken with a pickaxe, and it will drop glowstone dust, unless you have the silk touch enchantment, in which case you'll get the entire block. But you can craft four glowstone dust back into a block of glowstone, and it's a light source block, effectively allowing you to light up an area in the same way that you would with a torch or a jack-o'-lantern or something like that. Glowstone has other uses as well, which we will definitely get to in the near future. But around us, you can also see these trees growing up into the ceiling in some cases, actually, and these have some very unique wood to them. This is going to be crimson wood. We got some crimson stem right there, which unlocks the crimson planks, and you can use this much like you can any other type of wood. It can make crafting tables, it can make sticks, chests and so on and so forth. The one thing you need to know about crimson wood, and the same is true of the warped wood that you'll find in warped forests in the nether, is that it is fireproof. You cannot use it as furnace fuel unless you break it down into a general wooden item. Like sticks are fine because sticks are universal, you make them out of any different type of wood. There's no specific crimson sticks, but if you make crimson planks or you use just the crimson logs, you can't make charcoal out of them, you can't burn them in a furnace as fuel, and they will not be destroyed by fire, either here in the nether or in the open world. Don't, don't get me wrong, if you chuck them into a fire as an item, then they will definitely be destroyed. Or if you throw them into lava, same thing. But they can't catch fire in the same way that the wood types of the overworld can. Before I wander too far away from my portal over here, I'd better make sure I take the coordinates of it, since in the nether, navigation works a little bit differently. Since the nether is a cavern, maps don't really work because maps would show you a top-down view of the world, and the world is kind of closed off in terms of the nether the ceiling. Compasses will just spin wildly because the nether doesn't have a spawn point in the same way that the overworld does because you effectively join the nether from anywhere else in the world. And so nether navigation can be a little bit difficult. One way of getting around that though is to place a few torches around the world. So in this case we're going to place a torch pointing this way and that's going to show us the way back to our portal if we happen to run into this one. We could also do this by taking a couple of blocks, making a pillar out of them like so, and placing a torch pointing back in the direction of where we need to get to to our portal. This technique was pioneered by Skizzleman, it is called the Scumpus, and it's a really good way of navigating in the early days when you're still getting your bearings in a giant cavern like this in the nether. You can also do this in caverns in the overworld if you want to, and it's a pretty effective way of marking your territory and which way to go to get out. Now there's a bunch more resources that we can get hold of from here in the nether. We can grab some nether wart blocks, which unfortunately cannot be broken down into the nether warts you can use to craft them. We can get some weeping vines from the nether trees around here, and these can actually be climbed in the same way that other types of vines can, although the ones that we've just picked up, there we go, <laughs> we need to launch ourselves from the ground in order to get them. And while you can harvest these by punching them some of the time, you'll only get a couple of drops that way, and if you want to get more than one at a time, it's usually a good idea to bring a set of shears with you. The crimson fungi that you see around the area, these fantastic red mushrooms, can be picked up and replanted any 
anywhere they're effectively the saplings for these giant trees because even though they drop planks they're effectively meant to be giant mushrooms so if you want to regrow these you can bone meal one of these mushrooms but it has to be on the corresponding block of nylium which is the kind of red carpet material that we have around here that has taken over the netherrack and unlike grass nylium doesn't spread directly to netherrack we need to use bone meal to spread it and you can't obtain nylium without having a silk touch pickaxe so right now it's not really possible for us to bring these mushrooms back to the overworld with us and regrow them there if we want to get any more crimson wood we'll need to deforest this area and grow more of it right here in the nether it looks like we've gotten lucky and the area is relatively clear of hoglins for now hoglins being the giant like wild boar looking beasts that we've seen roaming the nether wastes in our introduction it looks like the piglins have actually killed the hoglin over here while i've been explaining some of this and here comes a baby hoglin right now which i'm going to attack using i guess the spectral arrows that we traded from those other piglins and that will outline it in a glowing effect and honestly baby hoglins are a little bit less of a threat than their adult counterparts they tend to be a little bit cowardly and will run away but they will occasionally come up and deal a little bit of damage to you so it's usually a good idea to attack them or run away from them if you have the opportunity to do that because otherwise they'll just stick around annoying you i don't want to get too lost in the crimson forest here and i didn't bring that many materials that i could use to mark the way i'm going but one thing i do want to find is yes there we go a warped fungus now we can't actually grow warped trees on the crimson nylium because they will have to be grown on the corresponding warp nylium which is the blue one that you find in a warped forest however fungi of both types will grow occasionally in the other biome and so we can bring this warped fungus with us and this has a couple of things that it does first of all warped fungus can be used as a defense from hoglins because they don't like the smell of it and will run away from the warped fungus if you place it down on a block of nylium so these are usually really good for creating a radius of safety around you if you end up in a warped forest biome like this one and have to at least defend yourself from the hoglins. And the warped fungus has a couple of other uses which we will get to later once we're ready to find a strider and ride out across lava lakes. But it seems like we are at the risk of information overload if we cover all of that in this episode. So I'm going to take a look around and show you some of the resources that we can find here in the nether now this right here is nether quartz which is totally safe for us to mine while these piglins are around we can get a bunch of xp from this and it'll also drop these quartz items which we can turn into blocks of quartz or use to make a variety of other things and nether quartz will drop more frequently from these blocks if we mine them with a fortune pickaxe in much the same way that you do with diamonds you can get between one and four nether quartz from a nether quartz ore and as you'll see that is fairly frequent here in the nether we'll find it all over the place and it's quite nice to gather a bunch of it while you can it's also a really good source of early game xp and oh there is a hoglin right over there so i'll try and steer clear of him but i'll keep my warped fungus handy if i need it looks like we've got one hopping up and down right here in fact there's two of them so i'm gonna try and take careful aim at these and keep them at a distance here we go we have an opportunity to use the warped fungus there we go and it just turns it away like that the same will be true of the baby hoglins as well they really don't like getting too close to warped fungus and it allows us to keep our distance one of the other resources we could look for in the nether is up here this is nether gold ore and we're going to be gathering a little bit of that although we need to be careful about when we do it because i mentioned that the piglins the regular kind not these zombified boys are very protective of gold and envious of anybody who ends up mining it and so if we end up gathering this within earshot of a piglin or if a piglin sees us mining this there's a chance they will get very angry. Even if you're wearing gold, it is not safe for you to mine gold ore with piglins in the surrounding area. So be very, very careful about when you mine it. The cool thing about nether gold ore though is that it breaks down into gold nuggets without you having to smelt them at all. And of course, gold nuggets can be crafted back into gold ingots, which will give us more things that we can trade with, or even at a pinch, if you have to come to the nether without getting gold armor in the first place, it will allow you to craft some gold armor that means it's safe to traverse through piglin territory luckily these piglins don't seem to have caught wind of what i was doing and i can happily trade the gold back to them after that hoping that they'll give me some more interesting resources these folks will trade you a whole bunch of stuff that one's just given me some more spectral arrows let's see if giving a couple more gold ingots to these folks will give us anything else that we can use 
There we go, we got an empty mm -hmm. bottle of water mm -hmm. from that one, and some more crying obsidian from that one. Okay, so we now have a couple of extra crying obsidian to our name. That's not too bad. Now at this stage we are risking a bit of information overload here in the nether, so I'm probably going to step back through to the other side. But one word of warning before I do, you cannot set your spawn in the nether using a bed. There is an item that we can craft to set our respawn point here in the nether a little bit later on, but for now, don't think you can bring a bed here, set it by your portal, right-click it and set your spawn. Since there is no day-night cycle in the nether, it has long been the case that the nether isn't a place that you can safely set your spawn, and in fact, if you bring a bed with you to the nether, that bed will explode, which is not something I'm interested in demonstrating right now. We'll show you that another time, but it is very important that you don't try and set your spawn in the nether using a bed. The other thing to keep in mind is that when you return to the overworld, time will still have passed while you are in another dimension. Even though there is no day or night cycle in the nether, time in the overworld will continue as it has before. Luckily for us, we were able to step out into full daylight here in the jungle, but we might not have been so lucky if our timing had been off, and so it's important to remember that when you're returning from the nether, you might be stepping back into a fight very quickly. So now we've constructed this nether portal here in the jungle biome, and we've determined that that our nether spawn seems to be in a crimson forest, I think I'm going to take a bunch more obsidian back from this lava lake. We're going to probably throw down a bucket of water here and keep mining up the obsidian around us. And we're going to build a nether portal closer to home, closer to our house and somewhere that we can use as a starting point to explore the nether in a more permanent way. Because aside from having some really important materials for our progression in Minecraft, the nether can also be used for fast travel. You can set up systems of nether portals that allow you to cross vast distances in a much shorter span of space, and so the nether is often used to make transport hubs to travel to and from different places in the overworld. In theory, 10 pieces of obsidian is the minimum we need to create a nether portal, because you just need the two from the top and bottom and the three on each side to create the interior of the portal frame. But I'm going to bring 14 as well, because I kind of like building traditional looking nether portals with obsidian on all the corners as well. So with 14 obsidian under our belt, I think it's probably time to put our diamond helmet back on and head back to the house because it's getting dark out here and I didn't bring a bed with me because they explode in the nether. Well, good morning. We're back here at the house and after I've killed off a couple of spiders in the local area, they're passive during the daytime, so I don't know why I do this, probably just for the spider eyes and the string, really. We're going to build a nether portal over here at our house and... It's kind of up to you how close you want to build a nether portal to your house, mainly because nether portals are a little bit noisy. <laughs> they tend to get a little irritating occasionally. So I think I'm probably going to put one down here. We'll kind of bury it in the hillside and maybe we'll find some cool ways to decorate this a little bit later on. But I think it kind of makes sense to have it down here underneath the enchanting setup in some way. And so, yeah, I think we'll probably build it into the floor here so that we can just walk into the portal whenever we want to like that. And yeah, we'll probably cut out the side of this hill and re-terraform some of this a little bit later. And I'm going to block up this hole because this looks like a death trap. <laughs> There's a bunch of water leading down to what seems like a, a cave system down there. Maybe we'll explore that another time. But for now, I think we're probably going to be fine just leaving this portal in here and maybe we just put a little bit of dirt over the top of it like this for now, as though it's sort of appeared in the hillside one day. There we go, our new portal to the nether is lit, and yes, it starts making really loud whooshing noises almost immediately, which is why some people don't like having them right next to their houses. But once we get up here, yeah, you can't really hear it all that much. Maybe we'll hear it a little bit when we go enchanting, but I think it's going to serve its purpose well. And I might throw some of this stuff back into a chest and we'll step back through to the nether and see where we are. Remembering, of course, to put on our gold helmet before we do. Okay, we'll step back into this portal and we step out into a slightly different location. This looks like another part of the same crimson forest from the looks of things. Let's take a quick look at our coordinates and let's compare those to the coordinates of the other portal that we made. It seems like our other portal is going to be in this sort of direction judging by the coordinates. I'm going to very briefly try and cut off some of this lava to make sure it doesn't end up flowing too far towards me. We'll grab a little bit more netherrack from the surrounding scenery in order to do that. It's really not that far away at all, so if I dig about 50 blocks in this direction, and downhill a little bit since it's displaced slightly on the y-axis, then we actually step out into the area that our first portal was. So from right there, 
All we need to do is run through this tunnel, up a little staircase, and out the other side, and right there is the portal to our house. And as you can see, this is a much shorter distance to travel than it was in the overworld. It's a distance of about maybe 75 to 100 blocks of travel compared to several hundred, probably 500 or more here in the overworld. So that really is the power of the nether. Even though it's a terrifying place full of scary creatures and about 100 different ways to die, it can be used to great effect. And I think we're going to spend a few more episodes this week exploring the environment of the nether and seeing what's out there around us. But for now, that's going to be it from me. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixorifs. Don't forget to leave a like on this episode if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.